Uh, this is going to be an addendum on uh, all the explanation, uh, the summary explanation of uh, certain things that I touched on in terms of the significance of revelations, in terms of understanding the inner psyche and the structure of the false ego and the particular gifts of uh, you know, how how the structure of the false ego is uh, is orchestrated to come to an end uh, through a certain process that involves certain spiritual gifts and I was talking about the kind of the cornerstone of those gifts being the gift of the apostle and relating that to a particular um, structure of a particular psyche that that precipitates the gift of the apostle, but um, uh, yeah, it's a it's a very uh, taxing issue, and I didn't want. I I don't think I said anything that was. Uh, it could be badly interpreted, and and because because of not elaborating on certain things so I thought that to navigate that danger I would just add in the extra steps uh, which I just kind of skated over when I said that when the two cities intersect that there's a kind of idolat uh, th there's an idol that that is a kind of idolatry symbolizes the idolatry of all the possible abomination um which is how the two cities in some sense can can grapple with each other but you know th these cities are themselves um the city itself is the symbol used in revelations of 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 the the domination of the world uh by the lust and so the it is knowledge of the world according to the lust it is uh the vanity of the false ego now when when I said that uh that the vanity in some sense is is a is a necessary thing that must be fully uh understood it must be fully discerned you have to you know the, the first the, the the first venture uh to 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 find the discerning spirit is found by first uh grappling with and getting to grips with the issues that the vanity when matured uh see the, the the vanity kind of reaches a crossroad because vanity will always uh produce its own suffering uh it will always produce its own yoke and it's part of the natural structure of the false ego is that the vanity wants to be graduated from it wants to be um transcended by the next stage of the false ego which would be the enticed lust which is trying to create a way to cheat the vanity itself and so and and that is what creates the most unconsciousness within the false ego is that as one tries to cheat one's own knowledge according to the lust um which is kind of like doubling down on the investment in the false ego and then having that doubling down eventually leading leading to a trial it shows you that you can't escape your own vanity in some sense and so you need another way you need a way to kind of face it head on and this is even symbolically represented by cain killing abel is that cain is the the vanity he is he knows how to work he knows the price of everything to grow it, everything because he's he's working the land he's the farmer Whereas Abel is just tending the flock, he's just you know he's found a way to cheat the system. He can just kind of uh, live off of the the um, the the naturally occurring increase that he just kind of has to parasitically uh, tag along for it. Whereas uh, Cain has to actually administer and grow knowledge of the world. He has to know that's the right time to sow. That's the right time. Uh, to reap and and therefore when he when Cain makes a sacrifice to God it it's always calculated because he always knows exactly what he's giving up whereas Abel when he sacrifices to God it's an unknown quantity because 
he is living off something that is sort of greater th th than his, uh, you know, it's all kind of, um, yeah, so, so it's out, so Abel is not uh, in view of some kind of perfect fatalism, whereas Cain is subject to, Cain knows his own imprisonment in some sense, and therefore, Cain is actually in a better position, spiritually as well, because he is, uh, what he has to transcend is within himself in some sense, whereas Abel um, could actually continue a whole culture, could, could generate a whole way of being, which will just always uh, escape confrontation with its own spiritual accountability, because it's just kind of living on a on a um on the non understanding and this is what eventually and w when he's actually profiting from that um that is what uh, enrages Cain um because uh although Abel's way of being is certainly let's say it's spiritually better on some superficial level um it has a fundamental hopelessness in terms of being able to overcome sin. So, I can, yeah, I, I don't want to, that's perhaps too much of a tangent uh, to, to get into, but um, to, to fully uh, go into the difference there. But uh, um, you could say Adam is, is symbolic of the death, Eve is symbolic of the lust, Cain is symbolic of the vanity, and Abel is symbolic of the enticed lust. And then when Cain kills Abel is replaced by Seth, and Seth, you could say, is uh, the trial. And Seth, uh, within the birth order there, you can understand the, the kind of... Seth has an older brother who is the eldest brother, the firstborn uh, human, and he doesn't know how to treat his brother, um, because uh, his brother is a murderer, his eldest living brother is a murderer, and he himself has to work out, well, where does the fault lie, you know, um, the, the firstborn of my mother is, uh, um, is a murderer, you know, so, so, so sort of, there's this uh, weird kind of familial, um, tension in some sense that he has to work out where is the um the nexus of this you know uh it, it says that uh seth was born in the adam in the image of adam um and so uh in some sense um it's it's a way to try and and this is what what in fact the trial is the uh, after the the enticed lust fails because it is actually overcome by the vanity because uh, symbolically um what happens essentially is that if you can imagine the great city of babylon is like a a, a city and then someone says, I don't like to live in the city, the city is uh, polluted or whatever, I have these problems against it, I'm going to go do something better, but I'm going to kind of live next to the city, I'm going to live adjacent to it. I'm, because of the city, because of the knowledge that I've gleaned from the city, I'm going to go and do something slightly different beside it. And when it does that, um, eventually the city kind of... Um, is jealous of the fact that that side project kind of only exists because of the structure that the city provides. Um, and so that, um, and, and because, you know, it can kind of work and it can profit in its own adapted setting that it has tried to create, but it's not a purely adapted setting. It's, it's a, um, it's a kind of uh, residue, you know, so Abel could only think to become a shepherd after he was the second born and he noticed that his older brother had domesticated crops, 
had had invented farming. So because Cain had invented farming, Abel could kind of take the concept and adapt it into effectively being a parasite on on a, a group a herd of mammals. So he it could, he could be the the shepherd of of sheep and he could kind of live off of them and protect them from predators and then he could uh, effectively kill some of them and live off some of the meat of some of them and all he had to do was sort of tend to their needs um and you know that is much more um profitable but that that only occurs because um because of the concept of kind of domesticating nature uh, but he domesticates nature in such a way that he doesn't have to quantify. He doesn't actually have to do all the planning because that's just the nature of the sheep themselves. And he's just kind of helping them and, and you know, found a way to kind of um, uh, profit by that kind of association, which he doesn't have to take full responsibility for. And so th this is... Um, and this essentially makes Abel into a gambler because when he sacrifices to God, he everything that he sacrifices is essentially a gamble that, oh, well, hopefully the well, everything that I sacrifice to God, is it really his sacrifice or is it the sacrifice of, of the flock? You see, the, the, this is the thing. So he's sacrificing to God and it does mean that he has less resources in a sense to, to live off of because he is keeping the flock and the flock is keeping him uh, through that association th that he's been able to control and when he sacrifices the firstborn you know like that could have been another member of the flock but instead he's sacrificing it to god so he is giving up something but what is he giving up he doesn't know the quantity it's an unknown quantity and why doesn't he know that because he does he's not in full control of what he's doing he doesn't fully own it so you know it's it's a kind of um He's found a way to cheat the system. He's found a way to live off of a kind of uh, a hope and a dream. Um, but it's not quite hope. And because he doesn't have a kind of a definite science of hope in what he is doing, except in the vaguest way. Um, so his hope is kept vague. And because it's kept vague, it never can actually develop the edge of discerning. It can never develop... Um, you know, a true spiritual uh, uh, maturing, you know, so the, uh, I mean, to put it simply, you know, he can never reach the stature of Christ. And on some level, Cain knows that. That is, in fact, what makes Cain angry, because this guy is not even going to be better than Cain, but he's going to find a way to hack the system, that he has, in fact, found a way to... Uh, um, to, to, to take from Cain's experience and to kind of adapt it in, in, a, in a kind of bastardized way. And I'm using the term uh, hack as in like computer hacking. He's found a way to, to hack um, from the experience that he can already see around him. And okay, so that's Cain and Abel. But um, so, so when you try to kind of do something outside of the city uh, from the ill-gotten gain of the city itself, um, I mean, this doesn't have to be like in this metaphor, I'm using a very blunt metaphor. The, the city doesn't have to come and send out its army and destroy this thing that's happening on the outskirts. It might just purely happen ideologically that the thing is kind of, because it is, it is not in control of its own. Um, when I say control, I mean, it's not truly responsible for what it's doing. And it will kind of, um, it, it, it gives it a kind of um, pseudo-integrity, which itself is intoxicating on some level, but that, that intoxication will eventually invite a trial, let's just say, in some sense or another. Um, you know, it's going to uh, be violating intellectual property rights, probably, or, okay, I'm just... It, it, yeah, you can make it... A real-world, sophisticated analogy from this that, that that would it's very easy 
to draw those things out. But um, what's my point? Uh, the point is is that the 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 consequence, the the secondary after this project fails for ideological reasons or because of pure conflict or whatever it's left in this position where it's like, well, we should have actually done something right at the start differently. Or, or it's like, we should have, how, how are we from the original position? How did we actually, so you compare yourself to the original position. So in the same way that Seth is born in the image of Adam, and, and I'm saying that he is the symbol of the trial, um, uh, which, uh, the trial is what is precipitated from from the um, the consequences of the delusion, the delusional thinking, and the kind of intoxicating um, misstepping which happens because of trying to generate an enticed um, formula that is greater than the sum of its parts. You know you're trying to cheat the vanity so basically i'm saying the point is is don't even get into the problem of the trial and cut off the enticement before it starts and that means that you confront the vanity and you dissolve the vanity um you as it stands that is where the spiritual battle must be fought is not by going down the garden path and then trying to rectify it that's too late uh, the the proper thing is is to confront the city as it were um and to make your own uh holy city then and to make your own new jerusalem or whatever analogy you want to use but um is is you have to uh, know how to construct the 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 kingdom of god in some sense uh, um these are all spiritual metaphors anyway but uh the so I was just going to focus now on on um, the gift of the apostle and how that comes from the deconstructed vanity. Now, uh, the reason why I wanted to add some additional details to what I said before is because um, because there might have been some confusion when I said that essentially because there are two vanities within certain personality styles and there are two great cities of Babylon, therefore, and then those cities intersect. And where the intersection happens, they have to, these two cities first have to know that there's a knowledge of how to mediate themselves. So there's already a kind of intrinsic idea that there needs to be something that is um, some nexus of self-limitation, which is already kind of... Um, you know, it has the potential to threaten the lust. So therefore... Uh, when you have two cities, two great city, cities of Babylon, which essentially could also happen between two people um, who are just in very good communication with one another. You don't necessarily have to have this within the same person, but obviously within the same person, it is the most intimately perceived. But anyway, the, the point is, is that each city, because, you know, cities are models of life. They have to include uh, in this um uh, a metaphor of, of the psyche. The, so the great city of Babylon uh, is just there to represent all power, authority, dominion. You know, it's described as having rich men, rich merchants and kings. So it has many kings in it. There are many kings of the great city of Babylon and there are many rich rich men and rich merchants. So it's, it's, it's more like the th how commerce works, how value works. That is what the great city of Babylon um encapsulates and in that way it also that's why it uh, is built on the blood of the saints because in in effect it is it, it has spiritual treasure that has been uh, worked into constructing a structure in in um, service to the lust so uh, yeah so it has many kings but it has one whore which is the kind of the, the coalescent um political feature in some sense and um it doesn't function well in some way uh it doesn't function in an orderly way i mean even the kings and and the rich merchants it says that they uh, are drunk on the wrath from the fornication with the whore so it's um they, they get to superficially do what should feel good they get to fornicate but the fornication 
itself um, makes them wrath. And the wrath is what they are addicted to. Like, um, so, so they're actually doing it. They're, it's like you can imagine an alcoholic drinking lots and lots of wine. What they're addicted to is the wrath in that sense. Um, so they are drunk on the wrath from the fornication. But okay, anyway. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good symbol of understanding the relationship between the lust and, and the um, the city. But the point is, is that in the city, it doesn't just have rich men and kings. It also has everything because everything has to have the vanity um, has to put everything in some place. In It has to have a, a vague, at least a vague understanding of what happens to everything. It has to have an associative chain that links up with all functional knowledge on some level, or at least the potential to. Otherwise, it's going to be incredibly um, brittle and self-critical, uh, um, which as a vanity, you know, it, it, that's the one thing that it can't be in some sense. It has to defend itself and grow. Um, but, uh, yeah, so essentially what happens uh, when you have two cities especially is that you end up identifying with, uh, let's say, a beggar, a poorer man in the great city of Babylon. And especially when you have two cities, you have two of these figures, one from each city, and they are the ones who are effectively, um, they end up judging the city, they end up fighting, so they're like revolutionaries within the city, um, in some sense, but, and, and they, you know, they, in, in revelations, they're described as being able to control the weather and such things, um, and so you end up sort of um, developing these figures, uh, this is an analogy, um, which are the witnesses. Uh, and these witnesses are part of the vanity, they're part of the great city of Babylon, so eventually they die. Um, they go through a whole drama, but that's part of creating what I was describing as the idol of abomination which is let's say the final the, the the final state of knowledge that these witnesses have that they can so it's sort of the witnesses are judging everyone in the city according to um what they know about that idol idol of 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 abomination which i said becomes uh, the lake of fire now the idol of abomination I said was the lake of fire or, or or will be the lake of fire. And that is the confusing part that I just wanted to elaborate on. Because it's... Um, yeah, in some technical sense, that's completely wrong. Um, but, but it's still kind of right. So uh, the the idol of of idolatry becomes the target of the second death and and i i did i think uh, accurately describe it when i was uh, saying that uh, it shows that the idol of idolatry is important for the awareness of darkness because unless you know how to hate the right thing uh, you 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 won't have uh, an actualized discerning spirit um, and so, yeah, th that kind of becomes the, um, th th that idol of abomination, uh, is the thing that generates the second death. And from, so, so the thing that so so eventually it, it becomes nothing. So like it just becomes something to be overcome. But that force that overcomes that idol of, of abomination um, is the generative thing that provides the second death and and um, and the lake of, of fire. But 
without it, um, the second death has no target. So, yeah, it's an important precursor. I think I did effectively say that as well in, in the original. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't sort of go through all, all the uh, stages. But yeah, the, the the sequence of things in Revelations. I mean, it, it's 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 remarkably amazing that how spot on it is in terms of the structure of the psyche that I understand. You know, without that kind of uh, detail of um, I haven't gone into uh, the beast and how the beast uh, re- keeps on reappearing with a different number of heads and different configurations of horns. And they're all uh, emphasizing different structural um, features of the false ego in its differing stages as it is decomposing or as it's being understood and discerned. Um, Because you you can't, it is very complicated. um, And I haven't, I have made recordings about this, uh, but I don't think I've um, made release those recordings but um it's very complicated stuff in some sense because there are 10 levels or 10 stages of of the false ego and it's compl- it, it's there there are three um the, the basic structure of the false ego is six stages where you have the death, the lust, uh, the vanity, the enticed lust, uh, or when you, uh, the vanity is also described by Luke as being drawn away by the lust and then enticed. So that, that um, and, and then you have the trial and the sin, and then the sin ha- um, brings forth death again, and then it recycles itself. But it's, it's actually more complicated than that, because there, it does that three in total three times. There are, in fact, three three of those circuits and they overlap each other and this is this is what makes it very hard to understand and makes it quite confusing is so that there are kind of three sympathetic circuits that overlap over 10 things so they're, they're if you can kind of map all the faculties of the mind you can kind of get a symbol that looks something like a pyramid with 17 steps um which can also be divided into eight spheres of earth and nine spheres of heaven. And within those nine spheres, three of them are actually are the Trinity. They're, they are part of the core of beingness. Um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or uh, should have said rather, um, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Um, which correspond to... Um, the 16th step, uh, the 14th step, and the 11th step is the the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Um, but anyway, um, and so anyone's particular false ego is going to cover 10 consecutive um, of those uh, uh, faculties. And uh, it, it can start at any level if it starts too near the top then it goes down through the bottom because it kind of um that that pyramid keeps on replicating itself keeps on making a new earth a new heaven a new earth a new heaven it's kind of like a fractal um so the false ego will will have a footprint of exactly 10 of those 17 uh, stages um or 17 steps and and the first six will be what i generally call the inner child and then um including the last two uh stages of the inner child uh will start um uh The, the the kind of the super ego and then overlapping the intersection between the two is is a third uh 
head of the beast in some sense, a third manifestation, which is kind of, which gets sympathetically, it, it gets rendered by the, the, the interrelationship between the inner child and, and the super ego in some sense. So after a while of the functioning between the, the inner child and the super ego, you get, um, you basically get a false God, uh, generated, um, it's kind of like the, it's, it's sort of like a pagan God. It's like you, you generate, um, an environmental false ego. So you, you start projecting fatalism into the world. You start projecting determinism into the world. And that is a kind of philosophical precondition for both the inner child and the super ego, but it starts manifesting the more that these two things, so so the, the more communication or miscommunication between the inner child and the super ego, the more you start to put your psychological energy, let's just say, invested into your environment. You start m making the world that you live in more magical than you uh, in some sense. And eventually it becomes actually the most powerful feature. So you become dominated by that. And so the, the, the generally conceived idea of God is usually that thing. You know, it doesn't have to be God itself. I mean, it has existed in other cultural aspects. The best example of this is uh, any culture that had um, a king that was ordained by God. Um, that concept itself uh, was usually a manifestation of this, that everyone would, would, it would be a sort of weird political religion. I mean, the most recent example of this would be the Japanese. And why, for example, the Japanese did not just surrender in World War II is because they did not want to lose the emperor. And this was not for some kind of silly pride. This was because the, the, the psyche of the Japanese people, um, that was like killing God. That would be the same as killing God is, is just um, uh, removing the emperor. You know, th this is why in, in ancient China, when the Mongols uh, took over, villagers just committed suicide because they lost their emperor because it fulfills this role within the psyche and when that is what has happened in culture if, if that is where everyone places that uh, um, significance in their culture um, you know it's literally like killing a part of yourself uh, an integral part of yourself that you can't live without um, so yeah but but anyway um so generally, this is people's most conception of the truth or reality. So for an, ag uh, an agnostic or an atheist who believes in determinism, or you have like a more feeling person who believes in a kind of strange fatalism, even who knows if they call themselves agnostic or atheist, or you have, you know, kind of church people in, in you know, some kind of Protestant so-called Christian setting that want to believe that, everything is is a direct consequence of god but that doesn't have a kind of philosophical dimension they they mean that in a kind of you know we are the children of the pagan sky father you know like like there's this big bearded man in the sky you know that 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 we have to conform to um that there's some kind of uh, a rule maker you know there's the um you know the there's some point at which, um, yeah, I, I don't want to go too much into false religion. Uh, it's going to be too much of a tangent, but um, yeah, there's a very big difference between, let's say, the literal interpretation of the scriptures and the spiritual understanding of the scriptures, um, and this kind of literal belief. Uh, uh, you know, that if you believe that something is a fact, uh, th then you can say things or know things, and then you can kind of cast white magic almost under the, from the power of that knowledge. When, you know, it, it is not true that the truth will set you free. The truth will not set you free. Knowledge, knowing the truth will set you free. That's what the scripture says. It says knowing the truth will set you free. So then you've just got this corruption of the word knowing and knowledge is if you could just 
say that you believe something or you just just say that oh it is literally true you can just kind of table thump that and and you've kind of done something spiritual or magical it's uh the best way to 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 see the difference is um is, there's a Must just slip my mind. I don't want to bring up. Uh, it was another thing that I wanted to bring up. Not the, the not to lean on your understanding. But to be subject to your understanding. Uh, with some kind of sense of humility, but also to develop an understanding that you're worthy to be subject to. Um, but that that's certainly, that's not the thing that I wanted to bring up. What I wanted to bring up was, um, was around the concept of knowledge. Um, what is the other teaching that is given about knowledge? Uh, It is always tricky and difficult if one tries to set up a test for for knowledge. It can be very easily counterfeited and, and made into some kind of superficial uh, hurdle, which becomes easy to uh, manufacture at will. I mean, this is how the, the scriptures have lost their... Um, meaning and words have been watered watered down oh and now i remember it it's um uh, and 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 i mean the, the biggest misinterpretation in in the so-called christian belief system is is not taking uh, 1 john chapter 4 seriously uh, when it says um I don't want to say the whole thing, but beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out unto the world. Hereby you know you the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. All those who confesseth, no, what does it say? The spirit of God. No, I think it's the spirit of truth and error. All. All those who confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and all those who confesseth not that Jesus Christ does not come in the flesh is not of God. Now, this is in the present tense. This is all in the present tense. All those who confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. It doesn't say has come. It says is come. So, and it says confess. It doesn't say believe. It doesn't say no. It says confess. How can you confess something unless you know it directly to be true? You can't confess something that you've read. That's hearsay. That's not direct knowledge. You, how, you cannot confess it. If you try to confess that, then you are just a liar. Um, so, you know, you've got, you've got this heavily literal uh, uh, bad uh, interpretation of, of this idea that you're you're sort of buying into some kind of historical narrative that you're parroting and and therefore you know something spiritual i mean it's on some level it's disgusting but uh yeah so i mean jesus christ is a spiritual name jehovah saves the anointed of god and you you can only confess that uh he has come is if he's in your heart of understanding and you know we have to say things like heart of understanding 
because uh, uh, even understanding as a concept has been completely changed to what people used to think it meant. You know, now that people have disassociated the heart with intelligence, with in intuition, uh, you know, I mean, do you, people in the ancient world, they cared not about uh, they, the organ in, in the skull was was thought to be, I mean, the Egyptians thought it was snot or something like that. I mean, when they embalmed things, they took great care when they removed the heart. Uh, they pulled the, the brain out with with, uh, with like a fish hook, you know, with, in little scraps. Uh, the, 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 the source of intention and purpose was in the chest, was, was, you know, the, the, the force of... Um, of of uh, drive to go and do something, and and that uh, uh, was not some kind of strange binary dichotomy of the human soul of uh, um, thought and action. Thought came from the chest. So so when it talks about n not knowing the heart and judging the heart. Uh, uh, it's it's an intellectual affair. It's it's uh, real wisdom. It's got nothing to do with, you know, just this pure feeling that that that, that doesn't have to check up on itself. Uh, you know, that doesn't have to know itself. That doesn't have to have an understanding. It's it's a complete. Um, I don't even. It is just. It's so. Uh, it just falls right into this false. Uh, uh, environmental god that, that that people have you know got this pagan sky father that controls their fate or their destiny which is essentially exactly what the atheist has done to the concept of of chaos theory or the concept of determinism or the concept of a clockwork universe or whatever semantic system he wants to make his pantheon uh, uh so what you know the the, the so-called monotheism um of the so-called christian that has the scape pagan sky father and these kind of karmic angels around him and these different forces of 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 people getting what they deserve i mean it's uh where's the spiritual discerning in that i mean it's it's uh it's not even close to any of the work that is described you know um But you know, fabrications are the uh, order of the spirit of man. Because the vanity wants something to, um, to harness. It wants value to, um, to... I was going to use the word indoctrinate, but that's a, a bit strange when I'm trying to follow the metaphor that the blood of the saints is is used to 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 feed wine to to the to the great whore. Um, you know, she's drinking the blood of the saints. the The blood of the saints is held in in the in the city. Um, it's sequestered there. Uh, A saint just means a, a tr true believer, um, and okay, well, this is a slight tangent, but this is worth pointing out. And when in Revelations, when it talks about the dead in Christ, um, this is not. Uh, uh, this is more about the people are made dead in Christ because of the the existence of the great city of Babylon, um, because that is, in a sense, sequestering all the blood of the saints. And so, because you understand that what Jesus did on the cross was he effectively, he entered into communion with his accusers. He gave them, um, he, in effect, afforded them um, uh, the integrity of Christ, um, and therefore, they got to to actually execute their will on him, and they got to see the consequences of their purpose, and therefore they could be cursed in a sense by their own um, 
by by truly apprehending uh, a full um, cycle of action, uh, so that they could use that as a basis to start um, appreciating the truth, uh, because they wouldn't they would have experienced something which they could not deny. Um, And so they could actually have the integrity to withstand their own self-doubt at that point. And they would have an example of truth upon which to um, actuate uh, uh, decisions and potentially rehabilitate uh, uh, their own consciousnesses. Um, Whereas if he had argued against his accusers then in a sense they, they would have had the argument to to um, retreat to and to dote on, whereas they had no argument, they had no um, resistance. Uh, they had a man who even asked God on their behalf, why have you forsaken me? And so that became their question, that they could, th- that belongs to them with no argument. Um so they won. They won against Christ, and they are left with the lingering question, why was this man forsaken um, by God? It becomes their question. That is the, the, uh, uh, that is the curse of the Holy Ghost. That is the, the Holy Spirit, um, as, as, it, as it is assimilated into the spirit of man. Uh, until it it uh, precipitates the 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 transformation to, uh, to lead it to the spirit of God, um, but but any anyway, okay. Um, I'm talking about uh, the great city of Babylon. Is there any anything else to add? Uh, I was talking about the structure of the false ego. So the the third stage of each of these things are each their own great city of, of, of Babylon in some metaphorical sense. But the, the only true one is the one in the inner child because that is the basis upon which the whole ego rests or the whole false ego rests is the inner child, is the only real true false ego. The, the adult superego which is created from that, is how the child avoids the trial. So when the inner child gets to the point in the false ego where he, where he generates the trial, um, which is effectively the trial of the enticed lust, which has failed too often, that he now has to find a, a permanent solution, um, he ends up creating the adult mask on top of the inner child. Um, and the adult mask generates its own death, lust, vanity. And when the more people live in their adult false ego, the more unconscious they are of their early decision-making um, ego. You can reconnect with your inner child uh, if you go into a sensory deprivation tank and, and you talk to it eventually. It'll start talking to you and you'll probably forget about it uh, afterwards. You'll get very energized. You know, the people that you see coming out of sensory deprivation tanks, they look almost like they're uh, demon-possessed because usually the inner child, when it starts speaking to you from the inside, it'll tell you crazy things. It'll play with you because, you know, the only reason why it speaks to you is because it literally gets bored. Uh, There's not enough uh, perception uh, in your field to, to kind of keep it thinking that it's Machiavellian or whatever. So it usually tells you that it's a demon or Satan or God. You know, it'll, it'll play with you because uh, the adult ego is the plaything of the inner child. It is, it is the defense mechanism of the inner child in some sense to, to find something to do with its time. So the real self is the inner child and the adult ego is really just this offshoot which is given to kind of a, a continual self um self abuse in some sense and uh, generally the cultures that humanity live in want people to be adults uh, in, have adult false egos because the adult false ego 
is the only thing that can actually, um, uh, let's say, subject itself to, to a job, to work. It, it can, um, it, its whole existence is predicated on being a kind of fodder. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it is, it's, uh, I mean, people are really quite, just the average normal person is really quite fucked up. You know, it, it's, it, it's, it's a, um, it, it, it's a play within a play, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, I mean, and, and when it talks in the scripture of people that are aware of their spiritual need, it's, essentially it's people who still have quite a lot of attention focused at, in the inner child region, you know, they haven't completely given themselves over to the mask. Uh, the best metaphor for this is the bleach anime, in fact. Uh, this, this actually uh, sim symbolically goes into all of the stuff in, into some great detail. Um, even the, the, the concept of the naming of the anime bleach, it's all about the process of, of bleaching the false ego in some sense. And when you look at the different abilities and the different things that exist in that universe is, is a symbolic metaphor. I, Naruto is as well, but I'm not going to go over that um, particular uh, uh, translation of these things. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the, this has generally been the purpose of, of these medias, is to translate uh, a lot of my work and findings uh, and, and to popularize it in some sense. And now that I've even said that, I open myself up to being branded crazy and being made vulnerable to... It's best not to talk about these things too much. It's, it's not really relevant to, to the substance and the meat of the things. Um, and the limitations, which... But yeah, so this is where you get the, the symbology in Revelations of the beast with three heads and ten horns. Um, and some, oh no, sorry, it's the, it, the first, uh, it has ten heads and six horns. Um, and, then, and then at some point it has uh, three heads and ten horns, I believe. And then it gets into various stages where one of the heads is badly damaged and some of the horns are broken. And and this is just the kind of... Because you, you have to actually end up understanding it from all the different levels. You have to understand it as ten heads and six horns uh, at the start. And then you, you really do have to see it as three heads and six horns. Um It is a lot to wrestle with uh, either way, actually. But um, the linchpins, uh, yeah. I, I hope to one day, uh, after generating my typology um, and elaborating it well enough that it can be understood by academics uh, and respected, perhaps, uh, that eventually I wanted to make uh, books on each type uh, that would be directed to the particular um, experience of the type from that type and so that it would uh, be able to address the, the false ego um, in, in, a, in a fairly tailored way that, that it would be able to give people a kind of access to controlling um, and deconstructing and decomposing uh, these kind of interior systems of control which were kind of laid down because when one creates them one does not know the field in in when in which one is operating in some sense um 
and and then you end up just experiencing life from that kind of calcified, regimented uh, uh, path, uh, which then leads inexorably to to a kind of um, particular course of uh, development, which uh, uh, you know is is uh, people are are effectively entrapped by it. I mean, it doesn't mean that everyone is going to have the stomach to to um, to want to do something about it, to want to confront these things. And there are so many uh, really terrible... Uh, uh, well, I mean, it's not that necessarily that they're terrible, but they're just sophomoric, uh, pseudo-religious, pseudo-spiritual... You know, and psychology is just such a, uh, as a subject, I mean, it's, it's just pathetic. I mean, it's, it's the, the, I mean, it's just, they try to steal some, some really strange facts from neuroscience and then they teach people neurochemistry and they think that they understand anything about psychology. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, they just want to kind of steal the authority of the white lab coat of, of the of the kind of the scientific consensus. And get away with kind of p peddling their their Anyway, there's is really no point in criticizing too strongly when uh, I feel anyone sensible must already know, you know, on some level they must be aware at, at kind of how um, how infantile, you know, the, 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 these kind of... Uh, confidence tricksters, you know, uh, on a kind of institutional level have have been operating um but anyway